Hey guys, welcome back to the channel and coffee and cartridges. Today we're going to talk about hydrostatic shock. Is it real? All right, let me be upfront. I am no expert in this topic. Um, and even, you know, scientists cannot agree on it. And different people just have different theories on whether or not hydrostatic shock could kill an animal. So just in case you're not familiar with what I'm talking about, the faster a bullet goes, based on its speed and the weight of the projectile, it's gonna in incur a hydrostatic shock, kind of an energy wave that surrounds that bullet and will cause energy upon impact. So not only is the bullet hitting the, am the animal and penetrating, but there's a hydrostatic shock that accompany accompanies it and creates a temporary wound channel and also could, you know, be a force against an internal organ or a nervous system. It could cause death by itself or could accompany the bullet's penetration as a cause of death. But whether or not it actually is killing things or contributing to the killing of an animal is up for debate. It's a controversial theory and not everybody agrees. So I myself am not here to tell you what the right answer is. I'm more just going to share my thoughts and hopefully we can get a debate going in the, in the comments that kind of explain what people think. I'd love to hear everyone's comments. I do know I've heard Ron Spomer um, talk about it and he's not a big proponent that energy kills. When I say energy, that's not really hydrostatic shock in itself, but I think that's what he's referring to. It's not about the energy, but it's about the bullet penetration and the bullet damage and literally the lack of oxygen and blood going to the brain. That's what's going to kill the animal. And so you want to disrupt that flow of oxygen and blood going to the brain. How do you do that? Lungs and heart, right? Um, you shoot it in the neck. It's, there's, there's a way to do it there too. You shoot it in the head. There's, there's many ways to disrupt that flow of oxygen and blood to the brain, which is what actually kills the animal. But it's that permanent wound channel or that, where that bullet's actually traveling or potentially fragments of the bullet are traveling that actually cause the damage leading to the termination of the animal, not the accompanying energy. And I think he's probably right to a degree. Another way that people try to put an animal down quickly is by their central nervous system or their spinal cord. So uh, a high shoulder shot or a neck shot or a directly on the spine a lot of times can hit those areas, the, the nerves and or the spine, and the animal can drop immediately. That doesn't actually necessarily mean the animal is dead. It just means it's incapacitated and it's on the ground, and which is good. You don't want it to be to run off. But is the animal dead at that point? Probably not. Not until the, what you've done is going to, again, cause the brain to stop functioning or the heart to stop functioning, it's still going to end up being when a lack of oxygen and blood are going to the brain. But now that could, that in fact does many times result in the death, but how long it takes, I don't know. Once again, I'm not an expert. I might be saying things a little bit wrong, but I do agree with Ron for the most part. But now a lot of people will shoot a deer with a 223 and then shoot a deer in the same place with a 300 wind mag and they feel like for potentially many reasons the 300 wind mag killed it quicker and they would contribute that to the much heavier increase in energy now in that comparison of course you're talking about different caliber bullets so a 30 caliber obviously is going to have a bigger full uh, frontal impact area you're talking six to seven tenths of an inch after it expands compared to a 223 expanding is going to be right around a half inch. So you just got a bigger frontal area causing a bigger hole, causing potentially quicker blood loss and 
or a potential a bigger potential hole in that heart. So of course, the bigger the caliber, the potential quicker it can kill. That's that's pretty obvious. But also, a 300 Win Mag versus a 223 carries a ton more energy because it's a much heavier bullet going potentially the same speed, but yet much heavier. Therefore, going and having much more energy. And without question, it's going to have much more of a punch on that animal. Some would call this knockdown power. Um, is it legit? I don't know. In some ways, it can be a myth if you're looking at it wrong. But, but let me put it like this. Let's say a 22 caliber bullet missed the heart and the lungs by a half inch, okay? Uh, it, it did its thing, it expanded, it caused a pretty good permanent wound channel. Let's say it even had good penetration, but it did miss that heart by a half inch. Now let's say in the same shot is taken, you once again miss the heart by a half inch, but it's with a 30 caliber bullet who expanded and penetrated the same, but yet still missed it by a half inch, but it has much more energy. Is it possible that that energy that it has is gonna cause hydrostatic shock as it goes right by that heart at a half inch, causing more damage, causing you know, a, a great force impact upon the heart that causes potentially the heart to stop or be destroyed by its force, that temporary wound cavity. Seems pretty logical that that could be the, the case. But maybe all that extra energy and hydrostatic shock that it has is all on impact. Maybe it's not going in. Maybe it all just hits on the surface and then it really doesn't have much of an impact. Now, if you watch tests in ballistics gel, you'll always see a huge temporary wound cavity the first, you know, two inches to like eight inches. There's always a big uh, temporary wound cavity. And then there's that permanent wound cavity, of course, that makes its way much deeper. And this is dependent on the caliber, on the cartridge, and on the bullet construction. You know, you look at a Burgers VLD, it, after like two inches, it just blows up, causing a gigantic temporary wound channel from like two to 10 inches, maybe 12 inches, and all the pieces just kind of blow into, fr into fragments, shrapnel, and go everywhere. And it's intended to do that. Other, um, like a monolithic bullet, it will have a, some kind of temporary wound channel, but it's gonna have much more energy being um, focused on its penetration in that permanent wound channel. So just different ways to look at it. Whether the majority of the energy impacts on the surface and that hydrostatic shock only is a surface thing or it has an effect as it goes through, I'm not really an expert to tell you that, but I could, to me, it just makes sense. If you miss the heart by a half inch, but you have a ton of energy, it would seem to me that it would make sense that you're gonna terminate that animal easier than with a bullet going through with very low energy. The same if you miss the central nervous system by a couple millimeters or the spinal cord by a couple millimeters, if it had all that extra energy and hydrostatic shock, it would appear to me that it would have some effect. But generally speaking, I do think that that hydrostatic shock is not as crucial as we think it is. So I have a friend who uses, or ha did use for a long time, a 220 Swift to hunt white-tailed deer. And he killed many deer with it. Well, one day, he saw a nice deer come out, he shot it, right in the shoulder, and the deer literally dropped like a sack of potatoes and didn't move at all. Gave it a minute, took a breath, was excited, climbed out of his stand, walked over there, and on his way over there, the deer jumped up and ran off. He then looked for blood sign and saw none and never did find the deer. And when the deer ran off, it seemed to be fine. It appears that he knocked that animal out Somehow, I know that seems odd, but I, it, it happened. He, he, the animal just kind of knocked out, got knocked out, knocked off its feet for a few seconds, maybe 30 seconds, woke up and was fine and ran off. That bullet just kind of blew up on the surface, 
caused a big impact, a lot of shock because there's a lot of powder in that 220 Swift case, but didn't penetrate. Probably hit that shoulder bone and just stopped right there. So that can happen. Also, that kind of makes you think about, let's just say a 243 versus a 300 Win Mag. Let's say you shot the, a bullet and you had good shot placement and that bullet went right through the heart. And just for the sake of this comparison, all things being equal and there being no expansion at all, the 243 is gonna go through the heart and make a 243 size hole. You know, 0.243 of a thousand being one inch. So basically just under a quarter of an inch size hole through that heart. Then take the 300 Win Mag, shoot through the same exact place, but it's going to have a 0.308 out of a, out of a thousand, so three tenths of an inch hole, which is bigger. Well, obviously the 308 hole is bigger, and but would there be a difference in how quickly that animal died? So let's just say this: if you shot both cartridges and the bullet hit the same place, both animals are going to die, right? Whether you shot the animal with a six millimeter or a seven and a half millimeter bullet, it's not really going to be that big of a difference. The bullet went through the heart and whether it's six millimeter hole or seven and a half millimeter hole, it's going to die. In theory, the seven and a half millimeter hole could cause blood loss and, you know, dis disruption of the function of that heart a little quicker resulting in a little faster death. But either way, the six millimeter hole is gonna kill it, just like it would in a seven and a half millimeter hole. But maybe the 30 caliber has double the energy. Would that result in more tissue destruction and more heart disruption than the other bullet that has less energy? What do you think? I'd, I'd love to know, because I'm, I'm not pretending to be an expert in the situation. Here's what I do know. When you're thinking about the most important factors in a bullet and its flight and its terminal destruction of your, of your animal, it's not energy and it's not ballistic coefficiency. It's bullet construction and muzzle velocity. So let me just back up for a second, talk about energy. Energy is a metric. It's a measuring stick. It's a standard. It's just giving you a number that's good information to have. So energy is just the muzzle velocity and the weight of the bullet. And you can just punch in a calculator and you're gonna know what the energy is coming out of the muzzle. Now I know there is environmental conditions to think about is the bullet stable? Is the twist rate right? What's your elevation? Was she shooting up a mountain? Was she shooting down a mountain? There are, there are other factors, but all things being equal, energy is derived just from the weight of that bullet and the speed in which it comes out of the muzzle. And then it's ballistic coefficiency is just how well does it retain its energy and its velocity? How good does it pierce through the air, how aerodynamic is it, the lower the BC, the quicker it's going to lose its energy and velocity. The higher the BC, the slower it's going to lose its energy and velocity. And so your energy is just calculated by those things at the muzzle. And then how quickly your energy level goes down is just calculated by your ballistic coefficient. Once again, I understand there's, there's wind and there's elevation and there's other things involved, but for the sake of this, those are just variables. So energy in itself doesn't kill. It's just a metric. And it's an easy way of figuring out if something potentially has enough, whatever the word is, force, oomph, killing power, stop, knockdown power, whatever, to take an animal at a certain distance. And sometimes we'll, we'll throw out things like, well, if it's got a thousand foot pounds of energy, then it's good enough for a, a white-tailed deer. Or if it's got 1,500 foot pounds of energy, it's good enough for an elk. 
And then some people will say, well, what in the world does that have to do with it? Well, it's just a metric. All that's saying is you have, your bullet is still going at a particular speed, at a particular distance, and therefore should perform adequately, right? So an, an energy number is a very good number. You want to know the energy and it's a good metric to have. And it's also a good kind of, you know, standard to say, well, let's, let's try to get the energy level at 1,000 or 1,500. But don't think energy is killing. It's just a metric. Same with the BC. BC is a very important thing to know, especially at longer ranges. Shorter ranges, there's just not enough time. There's not enough effects from the wind or effects from just the air density to slow that bullet down, and so it doesn't matter. But at longer ranges, it definitely matters. Not, it, it's really going to have a minimal effect on wind drift. The higher BC bolts are not going to be better in the wind unless you get way out there. At 400 yards, you're not you're going to see an inch or something of difference in a high BC bullet versus a low BC bullet. It's just it's going to take a long distance for that wind that wind bucking p potential to really have a factor. But the energy retention and the velocity retention is definitely noticeable at three, four, five hundred yards. But once again, the, these are just calculable numbers that we can therefore give measurements and weights and, and metrics. But it all is based on the muzzle velocity and the bullet construction. And of course, your muzzle velocity comes from what? your case. What makes a cartridge a cartridge is its case, not its bullet. What, what, what separates a 308 from a 30 6 it's the same bullet, it's the cartridge. And why is the 308 different than a 30 6 Because it has, it can hold different amounts of powder, it's, it, has, <clears throat> it has a different volume inside, and it can be shaped differently. So the shape of the cartridge, the amount of pressure it could potentially withstand and its overall volume is all that makes a cartridge a cartridge. That's what makes a 30-30, a 308, a 30-06, a 300 wind mag, a 300 weather be all different. It's what's behind that bullet and that is its case. So the case makes the cartridge the cartridge. And that is where you get your muzzle velocity, plain and simple. So when we talk about muzzle velocity, it's the powder that's in that case. We talk about bullet construction. And so the design and the construction of the bullet are vitally important. When I talk about design, I also mean, it, so the, the ballistic coefficient is gonna come from the design, the exterior design of that bullet. Your energy is gonna come from the weight of that bullet. And all that has comes back to design and construction. Is it, a cup and core? Is it a bonded bullet? Is it a monolithic bullet? Is it a full metal jacket? How is this bullet meant to expand? At what velocity will it expand properly? Is this, how will this bullet penetrate? At what velocity is needed for the bullet to penetrate like it's supposed to? So really what's important is not energy or BC. It's bullet construction and muzzle velocity. And when I say bullet construction, the design and construction of the bullet. So the bullet and the muzzle velocity, that's 99% of it. Energy is just calculated from those things, as is BC. So BC and energy are not the be all end all. They're just gonna give you good metrics and good ways to understand how that bullet and that speed are gonna perform downrange. So I haven't really answered the question. If scientists can't agree on it, obviously I'm not gonna be the one to break the tie or the answer, but what do you guys think? Do you think that hydrostatic shock is what's killing the animal or it, is it helping kill the animal or does it have no effect whatsoever? I would love to know. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe. More videos like this are coming out and other things in the outdoors. 
Um, check the description below for a few links of stuff I got going on. I'd love to have you join me on Twitter or Instagram or Patreon, whatever the case. Um, hope you've enjoyed this conversation. And until next time, take care.